Thank you for coming. I'm here to start the proceedings briefly. Uh, my, I'm Mark Schultz. I am chair of the Intellectual Property Practice Group of the Federalist Society. Uh, I want to do two things here. I want to tell you uh, that this panel is sponsored by the Intellectual Property Practice Group. Uh, it still surprises us from year to year that some of you are unfamiliar with the work of the practice groups. Uh, so that's one of my goals, is to introduce you to that and encourage you to join a practice group or several of your interest. Uh, not only do we put on these convention panels, but we also put on the teleforms, which I'm sure you've received many emails about. Uh, we, we publish articles and do a number of other activities that uh, I think uh, our membership uh, finds very beneficial and interesting. So I encourage you to join. And if you're particularly interested in the intellectual property practice group, uh, we, of course, work on IP issues as well as related technology issues. Please do uh, contact me or the Federalist Society. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce you to Judge Ryan Holt. Uh, judge Ryan Holt is a judge on the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. Uh, he joined the bench this summer uh, at the end of July. Uh, prior to that, uh, Judge Holt has been my friend for uh, many years, uh, and he has been a, an inventor, an entrepreneur, a patent prosecutor, an IP litigator, as well as an FTC attorney before he joined uh, academia, where he was my colleague at Southern Illinois University, and then the University of Akron School of Law. Judge Holt will moderate our panel, and I think we have a terrific panel. So thank you, Judge Holt. Well, thank you, Professor Schultz, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, it's my job as moderator to keep things moving on time and to focus the discussion on our title, which is Originalism and Changes in Technology. And I'll say at the onset that I've received a number of text messages from friends in the last couple of days asking, well, what is this panel going to be on, or how are you going to tame Professor Epstein into only speaking for eight minutes on this at the onset? So uh, w wish me luck, and um, I I'm not sure where this will go. So. I'm taking 10. Yeah. No. I have a team of law clerks at the front, though, with signs that say stop, uh, ready to go. Uh, so uh, I'll make the introductions brief, and then we'll move right in, uh, in order from uh, your uh, right to left, um, and then we'll move into open discussion and hopefully have plenty of time for questions at the end. So on my immediate right, Professor Richard Epstein is the director of the Classical Lib Liberal Institute and Lawrence Tisch, Professor Emeritus of Law at NYU School of Law. Also the James Parker Hall Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Senior Lecturer at the University of Chicago School of Law. And Peter and Kristen Bedford, Senior Fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution. Uh, farther down the line, the Honorable Professor F. Scott Keefe, another bow tie person. Uh, I like the majority of bow ties on the panel for sure. Oh my god. The Fred C. Stevenson Research Professor at the George Washington School of Law and the founder of the consulting firm Keefe Strategies LLC was previous to uh, his position at George Washington, a commissioner of the United States International Trade Commission from 2013 to 2017. <coughs> On the other side, also in a bow tie, Professor John Duffy, the Samuel H. McCoy Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law, Professor Duffy has been invited as one of the 20, has been identified as one of the 25 most influential people in the nation by the American lawyer and one of the 50 most influential people in the world by the UK publication Managing Intellectual Property, a former clerk to Judge Stephen Williams on the DC Circuit and Justice Scalia on the US Supreme Court. And finally at the end, not in a bow tie, Anthony Dick is the chairman of the board of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, also known as the acronym FIRE, and an attorney at Jones Day's DC office in the Issues and Appeals Group. His practice focuses on constitutional and appellate litigation before the US Courts of Appeals and the Supreme Court. His written articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, National Review, Scottish Blog, and the Washington Times. Anthony clerked for Judge Griffith on the DC Circuit and Justice Alito on the US Supreme Court. We'll turn things over to Professor Epstein. For his 30 minute peroration, first of all, I'd like to make a correction of the record. I am an emeritus professor at the University of Chicago and an active professor at the 
uh, NYU University, and you managed to get it backwards, which I'm sure is an intellectual property violation of uncertain consequences. But that having been said, my job is actually to do the originalism number with respect to the uh, Constitution and not to spend our time so much, at least on the digital age. And so what I'm going to do is basically go through the clause word by word, phrase by phrase, and try to tell you what it is that you can learn from this and what it is that you cannot. Originalism is a general philosophical position. I understand it to run as follows. You could start at any random point and you could think that you could go 360 degrees in any particular direction. What a constitutional provision does is it narrows the arc and the great debate is just as to how much does it eliminate. And I think actually with the intellectual property clause, it eliminates a fair bit of kinds of things. Uh, there are, and I'm going to tell you where I think it's clear and where there are ambiguities. So we start off with to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. That sounds perfectly benign. Uh, there's one important point that I think has to be remembered about this. Uh, the practice of issuing patents when you were in England was to issue them not because you were promoting science or the useful arts, whatever that phrase means. It was designed to secure revenue to the crown by creating import monopolies with respect to certain kinds of goods. And putting this particular phrase in the Constitution means that that particular practice is not something that can be allowed. Uh, the ambiguity that remains is exactly what do we mean by the uh, phrase useful arts. Somebody could say it only deals with copyrights uh, having to do with technical procedures for making blueprint drawings and the like. I think in effect useful arts would alas even cover things like literature and so forth. That becomes an interpretive point. And if you start going through the sort of the incentive arguments which I think are behind all of this, it would be very odd to want to include those kinds of works outside the scope of the patent protection, so you would start to bring them in. So that's the first clause. Then we secure for limited times. Well, it's an extremely important phrase that we do that because uh, the central challenge with respect to intellectual property is why is intellectual property in some sense different uh, from other forms of property, uh, including intellectual property like trademarks and trade names and so forth, or land. And the basic argument is that this kind of stuff uh, should never be given permanent inclusion because you want the incentive to create it, uh, but unlike physical property, it could be used by A without compromising the ability of B to use this sort of thing. And what the clause does is not to specify exactly what the term ought to be, uh, but to make it very clear to people that you understand the nature of this trade-off and so that the limited times have to be there. Uh, the then question that is ambiguous which is left to that is just how long is it going to be? And I think generally speaking, if you made the term so long that it embraced the entire useful life of the particular patent or copyright, uh, you would be out of sync with respect to the Constitution. So that pushes you to shorter periods. And I think the case which tested this is the one about the Copyright Term Extension Act, where I thought they went absolutely overboard, uh, making limited in effect de facto unlimited with respect to what is going on. So that's the second thing. And then it says it gives you the rights to authors and inventors. Uh, well, we don't have a definition of either of these two terms, uh, but what it's perfectly clear that it's designed to do is to say that this right is individual to the people who start to create these things. And so the important thing to understand is what it excludes. And in this particular case, it would exclude modern claims uh, with respect to the protection of various kinds of folk laws and folk remedies that don't have themselves discrete authors. Those things would intentionally be understood as having been already put into the public domain. And I think when you start looking at the uh, situation here, what you come up with is the conclusion uh, that in dealing with this thing, those kinds of claims are necessarily to be rejected, leaving open the question of how you deal for for example, with such complicated questions as joint authorship or joint invention of particular kinds of advice. Uh, the next phrase that you have in the Constitution is the phrase, the exclusive right. And it turns out this is actually an extremely important phrase in terms of the way in which we want to construct and understand the clause. Uh, many modernists, when they start to think about the patent and copyright situation, would prefer to put in the place of the words exclusive right uh, the word monopoly. And it turns out that you get a very different sense of a proportion if, in fact, you change the nature of the term in question. A monopoly is something which you have to be extremely worried about uh, because there are no close substitutes for it. And you're afraid that the combination of price increases and diminished utility will result in a loss of social welfare. You put the word exclusive right in there, it doesn't carry with it that kind of negative connotation. And it is also represents a different situation. It turns out the only kind of quote unquote monopoly you have with the intellectual property is the same kind of monopoly that you have over 800 North Michigan Avenue, apartment 3502. 
It turns out that I have an exclusive right to the place wherein I live, but there are a lot of competitive units which have roughly the same kinds of characteristics. So the point of creating a system of exclusive rights is not to promote a monopoly. Uh, the purpose is essentially to compose a, a competition system that you want to create out of this situation. And you do so by saying that there are lots of people who get lots of exclusive, exclusive rights over particular forms of property. And then the, the next cause that you're starting to always worry about uh, when you start to deal with this is exactly when you put this thing into question, um, just how exclusive it's going to be. And the answer is, I think, pretty much you want it to be quite exclusive with respect to this, and you don't want this thing to be a mistake. The other thing, of course, that's true about this is the only thing that you get out of the copyright and patent clause is exclusivity. The actual substantive content of the right in terms of your ability to produce and to alienate it is something which under this definition would be left to state law. And then the question with respect to their respective inventions and writings, um, I think it's extremely important to do this because this introduces a kind of a dynamic element associated with respect to the way in which the clause is put together. Uh, there is no specification of what a writing looks like, no specification of what an invention looks like. And so what happens is uh, you can't go around and saying, well, these dumb originalists didn't understand that nanotechnology um, is going to be something that you have to worry about, and they didn't provide for that. Uh, the definition of these things is completely fluid and totally open. And so to give you an illustration, Congress has the power to regulate commerce amongst the several states. And that surely covers uh, stagecoaches and wagons. Uh, but when you start getting telephones, you start getting airplanes, you start getting railroads and so forth, these things are subject to exactly the same rules. And so if you've got an airplane which does a local journey, it should be out from underneath the federal power. If it goes across state lines, it should be in it. So the most important thing to understand about this is given that the term itself has a certain dynamic component associated with its particular operation, there's no particular reason to upgrade it and so forth. And when you start looking at little inventions and so forth, what you realize that in miniature, they're like big inventions. They got pulleys, they got switches, they got things that come together and open up. And so, okay, you're doing this at the molecular level, not at the uh, large level, but exactly the same kinds of principles should apply. So the problem that you have associated with durability of a constitutional provision on this area is, I think, much less than other people might want to say. And you could work on blockchains, digital technologies, anything that I don't understand, and I can figure out how to work it within the framework of a patent system, which is built for the ages. Another point which I think is clear is we want this to be a uniform system nationwide, so we don't have this done at the state level where the protections are too limited. Now, what is it that the clauses don't cover? And here, this is the general problem associated with originalism. And it turns out there's no way that you can avoid it, uh, but you just have to really understand it. So what are the kinds of issues you worry about? So the first question is, how far do the things go to cover things that may not be quite inventions, may not be quite writings, and so forth? There's always a question of penumbra. So you get cases like Benito boats and cases having to do with formats and so forth. Do these things come under the patent law? Do you protect them if they don't come under the patent law? You're not going to be able to solve that by this particular test. You're going to have to have a combination of its sensible adjudication and reasonable statutes to deal with it. Uh, the question about whether or not there's a justification for invalidating patents or copyrights and so forth, essentially what you're doing is you're given a grant of power. You're not given this code of civil or criminal procedure to let you know what to do, what justifies an infringement, what does not justify an infringement. That's true of everything that we have in the Bill of Rights. Uh, we have a protection of freedom of speech. We have no particular guide from the text itself that's thoroughly reliable to say whether or not clear and present danger of a particular harm that the government has the right to prevent is or is not a justification. You have to walk that out normatively. I think there are ways to do it, but you must, uh, in fact, do that. And then it turns out that you don't handle the remedial question. All we believe is in the eBay system where the presumptions against injunctions are for injunctions and so forth. None of that comes uh, within the test. Now, how is it they're trying to fill these gaps? I can't see this clock to know how much more time I have, but I'm going to take 30 seconds, a minute, whatever it is, um, uh, to sort of do this. What happens is the only way in which you can do this is refer this back to some kind of larger intellectual framework. And I think the framework that we have to understand is driving uh, the entire intellectual property clause is the same thing that drives the rest of the Constitution. This is not a libertarian doctrine. 
So you can't say we don't want patents because they interfere with the people to do whatever they want with their own property. It turns out that it's a classical liberal situation in which you are entitled to restrict some kinds of freedoms if in exchange you give people writ large a greater capacity to do things. And so if the patent system is uniformly applied and largely positive sum, it's perfectly okay. And so what you then do within that tradition is import the various rules that deal with remedies, justifications, and so forth that you would apply generally and then see how it works to the patent system. And if you do that, you know, it's exactly what you see happening. How do we deal with latches? How do we deal with bad faith? How do we deal with uh, contributory infringement and so forth? There are ways to handle those things. So I think that what the lesson you want to learn from this about originalism uh, you can pack good ideas in relatively small spaces, and that if you actually parse the words and go through each of them and figure out what they're designed to include and what they're designed to exclude, it doesn't solve all problems. That would be silly, but it does limit the range of inquiry to ways that make adjudication and legislation in future periods both sensible and manageable. Thank you. Am I on time? Uh, a little bit over, but perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Epstein, and now Professor Keefe. Well, uh, very uh, nice to be with everybody, so many friends. Uh, thank you, Judge Halt. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Epstein, and uh, thank you to my future uh, colleague commentators as well, um, uh, and to, of course, all of you. Uh, our panel on originalism and technology um, was advertised as covering more than just intellectual property as somebody whose major contribution to healthcare is curing insomnia by writing books on patent law, I can't um, avoid some discussion of patents, but let me um, offer a few more ideas as well. As we think about originalism and as we think about the founders and we think about new technologies, it's easy to construct um, two images in our head that don't go well together. Uh, one is uh, the internet and the other is old white men in wigs. They just don't appear to be uh, workable in the same, uh, same system. And if you think about it that way and stop, I, I guess they're not. If you think about it differently, maybe they are, and maybe they are really well. And here are some reasons why. Some core themes associated with the founders view of the Constitution and the system the Constitution would create and enable are really, I, I think there are two core messages that we could uh, focus on. One is meaning and the other is professionalism. Let, let me unpack those a little bit. Uh, yes, many of us are lawyers and we fight over meaning, but I don't think we or they thought all words have all meanings or no meanings. They made very deliberate choices when writing, and in those choices showed that they had different meanings for different words, different constructs, different components of our legal order. And professionalism, sure, they were in a sense amateur farmers and amateur silversmiths and amateur lawyers, but gosh, they beat the largest standing army on the face of the planet at the time and put together a document that looks pretty legal and managed to run a pretty significant country uh, through all of that, and I think there's a lot of professionalism that flows from those very deliberate choices about meaning. So let me give you some concrete examples in three areas of law, IP, in trade, and security. So patents, as Richard was suggesting, the British system did have patents, and our framers framed against that backdrop, and our country started against that backdrop, and there were some obvious similarities, including the word patent, and there were some striking differences including not simply giving them out to friends or giving them out to raise money for the central government or giving them out in a way that was um, most likely to create monopoly effects and most likely to create social anxiety and economic uncertainty, which is to say willy-nilly. 
willy-nilly or flexible discretion, there are a lot of ways to say it, the founders and the original patent systems in the colonies and then in the country were deliberately structured to do something very, very different than what the British system had often done that Charles Darwin um, wrote about um, that, that um, lots of uh, famous British writers wrote about, including, of course, if you think about this great story, The Poor Man's Tale of the Patent, which includes reference to the old British Patent Office as the Circumlocution Office. The idea being, of course, that there were lots of, um, lots of flexible discretion decisions being made, and the poor man's tale of the patent tells the story of going to the bureaucrat to ask for the exercise of that flexible discretion and being sent, in effect, to the next bureaucrat for the same flexible decision making. And the story concludes with being worn out patience and pocket. Um, not a system that's going to foster investment, commercialization, and the delivery of new technologies to market. So here's how people often phrase that today. They say, oh my gosh, uh, these poor old white men in wigs could never have anticipated these new technologies like the internet. Well, patent law has a term of art in it. The term of art is anticipation. And our patent system did anticipate those new technologies by choosing to make one of the core requirements for patentability no anticipation. Put differently, anticipated technologies are not patentable unanticipated technologies are. That's why we want patents on them, is that they are new. So that novelty question, or as patent lawyers call it, anticipation, that, that's not just a, a gist or, hey, you know what I mean when I say it's good. That's a concrete word with very specific meaning chosen precisely because it gives less discretion more certainty and investment. Let's talk about trade. Hamilton, one of the founders, tried very hard, very unsuccessfully, given the state of the art at the time, but very hard to make trade decisions on tariffs based on data. We're still struggling with that, but Hamilton and Lincoln and others since have tried to focus, tried to constrain that decision making to be data driven. Let me give you a final example about security in view of the time and point out some core differences anchored in originalism. Everybody remembers the fight over the warrant for the Apple iPhone key. And it's worth noticing that that fight took place in a US district court exercising criminal law power using what federal lawyers think of as Title 18 of the US Code, criminal law. But here, here's the thing about Title 18, and they, they do you a favor on this one, they give it away in the name. Tucked into Title 18 is that number 18, which implies there are a whole bunch before, and by the way, some after. You see, because had the federal government wanted the key, it could have exercised a number of other of its statutory and constitutional powers, including, for example, the takings clause, which does not say don't take. It just says please pay when you do. So had we framed our discussion about whether to get access to that key not merely as is it good, is it bad, or is it a criminal requirement, we could have framed it in the context of any of these other different discussions different meanings deliberately chosen by these professionals who framed. I'll leave it there. Okay. Professor Duffy. Professor Keith. All right, and now to somewhat move us out of the patent context, Professor Duffy. Thanks a lot. Um, strange again that I'm moving you out of the patent context because I uh, teach patent law and have a casebook in patent law, and I've spent a lot of intellectual time on that. Um, but I want to open with a, just a few remarks. First of all, 
I've been identified as influential in intellectual property, not more generally. So, okay. you know, if you're thinking, who is this? If you know intellectual property, maybe you know me, but not otherwise. Um, one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons I'm here, one of the reasons I'm interested in intellectual property is I, I did my undergraduate degree in physics, and so I had a physics degree, and I always was quite proud of that. Got it from a reasonable institution. And, um, and I, uh, I, 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 I realized though law is quite different. Um, and I, I think that was really driven home to me when I uh, was uh, a young lawyer and was preparing to, got a call to interview with Justice Scalia for a clerkship, and I, I said, well, I'm gonna read everything I can. So I read just about everything that I could possibly read about Justice Scalia, including his entire confirmation hearings, cover to cover. And I found a little snippet in there. He said, I'd never want, I, I don't think law is, is really, needs to concern itself with technology. Um, that's really something that is completely separate. And I would never want a law clerk who's technically trained. <laughs> So needless to say, one thing I learned is I was not going to raise my technical degree in the interview, which I did not, and uh, that probably was a good idea. Um, but the other thing was I thought a lot, a lot about the interface between technology and law, and I think generally I agree with Justice Scalia, and I think Richard's points, Richard's points are also similar to this, that a lot of times technology doesn't affect um, the principles of law, and, and especially constitutional law. Yet that point is not uncontroversial. So for example, if you look back at the progressive era um, and New Deal era, and the theorist of that era, and say, what did they talk about when they were building up and justifying the case for these new institutions of administrative agencies, another area that I teach? Um, they repeatedly rely on scientific change. Um, so you'll get people like an early theorist like Charles Francis Adams Jr., a, a you know, descendant of the president's Adams, and he talked about this wondrous new world we're in because of the amazing scientific advance of the steam engine. And, and you know, that was just, we're just living in a different world than the framers were, and so that was an explanation that was routinely invoked. He not only did that, Adolph Burley, who before he became a corporate law theorist was an administrative law theorist, uh, James Landis, who was one of the most influential uh, theorists of the early administrative state, uh, one of the youngest deans of Harvard Law School ever, um, also talked about how we don't need to follow Montesquieu's triadic lines anymore because this is a different world. We have so many uh, uh, different inventions and different social innovations that the wisdom of the framers is, um, is just really beside the point. I, I think we see that not only in the past, but even in, in current days. There's a book, and I won't name the name, but uh, influential theorist of, of telecommunications law who in 1997 published a book about telecommunications and change and argued against administrative agencies and, and, uh, and in favor of abolishing uh, the FCC in particular, but more generally against administrative agencies. Once again, why? Because of technological change. And you know, I'm, I, I'm sort of at the Federalist Society, so if you wanna argue for you know, cutting back on administrative power, I'm, I'm all ears. But if you start talking about technological change, I think you lose me. I don't think that's a solid argument. I don't think it was a solid argument to build administrative agencies. I don't think it's such a solid argument to uh, change administrative law. I think the structure of our government and the wisdom of the framers doesn't really change based on uh, technology. Um, and so I'll give you a concrete recent example. So for example, at the Federal Circuit, which is the patent court, you know, that everybody knows, they recently held unconstitutional all the administrative patent judges, um, citing an article I wrote uh, a few, some years ago entitled, Are Administrative Patent Judges Unconstitutional? Um, and now I'm working on a follow-up, which is Congress actually passed the statute to remedy that problem, and now they're working on a new one. They're gonna have a hearing on Tuesday my, I, I think my new article has to be entitled, Are Administrative Patent Judges Unconstitutional Again? Um, but I'll tell you one thing that will not be in that article or in my congressional testimony. I'm not gonna be talking about technological change. I don't think it's relevant. It's an appointments clause, separation of powers issue, and I think that that's really sideways. Even though people make these arguments that, oh, it's a brave new world and everything is different, that usually is a terrible argument. Um, but it comes up in history, so know it when you see it, and know that it's been run um, many times before, and in general, it's a bad argument. 
Um, then there, I think, the sort of middle tier where I think technological change does change things, but usually on a fairly micro level. Um, I think Richard talked a lot about this, and I, I think I agree with most of what you say. That Amazingly the, enough. I, it's amazing. It's amazing. There's only one tweak I'd make to what you said. You said that the language the framers uh, chose was flexible. Um, and I and always worried. Use that word. And I actually... I didn't use that. I'm pretty sure he did, but we'll check the transcript. But, um, but I, 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 well, if you didn't use the word, then I, I misheard because I thought you said flexible, and of course, uh, I don't like flexibility. Um, so uh, I think the Constitution is not a yoga document. It doesn't have flexibility built into it. I think that it, that language, the language in the in the patent, the intellectual property clause is broad, but that doesn't mean it's flexible. And I think we agree ultimately on the on the outcome, which is that. The patent language is simply broad, and a lot of things um, are constitutional. That means that uh, the original meaning is fixed. It simply is very broad that Congress can make a lot of things, whether they be inventions or writings, they can extend the intellectual property uh, clause to that. And I think a good example is the mid 19th century, um, the mid 19th century change to um, add photographs into uh, the copyright system, which was kind of a big step at the time. It seemed kind of big, although I, I think in the grand scheme of things, it's a rather micro change in copyright law. The same property rights system was changed. In fact, if you go back and read the history, it's kind of interesting. The first district court decision that had this issue, the, the current existing copyright statute actually had, among the things that could be protected, prints. And you might think like, well, that's photographs, right? Like when I was a little kid, my mother said, I'm going to go down and get some prints of these photographs, right? And she meant, you know, she's going to get hard copies of the photographs. So saying that something is a print, you'd say, well, of course it covers photographs then. But the judge said, well, print only means that you've got to have pressure. It's got to be pressing down on the, on the paper. So if it's just using light, then there's no pressure, and therefore it's outside the scope of print. And that's kind of... Just sort of, you know, that didn't age well. It got overruled by Congress very rapidly. And even today we think, boy, that's, that's not a really good definition of print. Um, so there are small changes like that. And we have to be careful not to read language too narrowly because lots of times both the Congress and the framers chose relatively broad um, uh, language. The final thing I'll say in my last minute is just, I'll just leave this for future questions is, is there anything where technolo technological change does actually present us with some problem that's, that, that seems actually quite new? And there may be, and I'm not totally convinced because I'm always a skeptic when people say there's, there's new things going on, um, but I think that the, the problem of data aggregation, of publicly available data aggregation, is something that might be quite new. So most of you know in the room that the Chinese government is instituting a huge system where it sort of captures people walking on the street with facial recognition. And in some ways you think like in our constant, that, that sounds anathema to us in our liberal, in our liberal government, our, our classically liberal government, and sort of monitoring where everybody goes. On the other hand, it's not clear that it would violate any constitutional rule if our government were to do it. It's people out on the street, they, you know, if you, Ask somebody, was John Duffy on the corner of 17th and Connecticut or, or, or uh, I Street in Connecticut? Somebody could say, yeah, I saw him there. So the government's government land, you could put cameras out there and you could capture all it. But it does seem to pose some sort of new threat that I think society is still beginning to think about. Now, our society, European societies, and maybe even Chinese society, at least the dissidents in Chinese society are thinking about it. So I'll close there as, as something where we might have something really new with technology that might affect our constitutional law. Great, thank you, Professor Duffy. So in our last introductory remarks from, from Anthony Dick, who did respond to my biography email and confirm things correctly. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Anthony. 
It's a nice, nice backhanded introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so those of us who are here at the Federal Society, I think many of us have the happy advantage of being both originalists and classical liberals within some range of that definition. And, and in that position, we often enjoy the happy situation of having those two principles align and come together. And changes in technology are often advanced by intellectual opponents of ours as reasons to depart from originalism, to depart from classical liberalism. Sometimes those arguments take a bad form. You know, we've invented the steam engine. Holy hell, let's get rid of enumerated limited powers. Uh, doesn't seem to follow necessarily. Sometimes there are better versions of that. Uh, but I want to just go through a few examples of those uh, and, and talk about how generally originalism can be used as a tool to push back in favor of classical liberal principles. But then why in the world of patents, I think some recent developments at the Supreme Court have thrown classical liberalism and originalism into a bit of tension, if not opposition, and why that may cause some consternation for us and, uh, and give us reason to think we sometimes may have to choose between the two. So um, some examples, I think you guys probably are familiar with many of the, the arguments about why changing technology requires us to abandon original meanings uh, of the Constitution. So in the, the First Amendment context, a particularly good example of what I would consider a bad argument was published in the Washington Post a few weeks ago where the argument was made that the marketplace of ideas view of free speech no longer obtains because, quote, on the internet, truth is not optimized. On the web, it's not enough to battle falsehood with truth. The truth doesn't always win. In the age of social media, the marketplace model doesn't work. Therefore, the author argued, we need to ban hate speech. Again, I don't think the conclusion follows quite from the premises. Uh, a better argument you sometimes see in the Second Amendment context with Heller telling us that the Second Amendment protects the right to bear arms of weapons that are in common use in society. Uh, what about assault weapons? You hear people say that was a degree of destructive power that may not have been contemplated by the framers. I think that argument has some force even if you make allowance for people distorting uh, assault weapons to mean something uh, which most people uh, misunderstand what, what weapons like an AR-15 that are in common use. Again, I don't think this argument ultimately succeeds, but it starts to move closer to the line that the cost-benefit trade-off of what the framers may have been thinking about with a musket might not apply to a semi-automatic weapon where you can kill 30 people in, in a minute without much trouble in the way you would have to with reloading a musket. Uh, you also see this, I'll skip the Third Amendment because we don't have any quartering of soldiers yet, at least not until the next presidential election happens. Uh, with, with the Fourth Amendment, um, you know, you, you, you see some better arguments here, and uh, the originalist con conceptions of trespass, property invasions, a lot of people think today don't quite capture the value that the framers were trying to protect of privacy, so you replace a trespass model with a reasonable expectation of privacy model. Uh, I happened to clerk at the Supreme Court the year of the Jones GPS tracking device case, which actually reminds me a lot of what Professor Duffy mentions, which is that you have a plain view doctrine where the ordinary rule would be if something's seen in public, uh, there's no problem with the government, uh, you know, tracking that and, and following you around physically, but what about when you have a new technology where you can actually create a mosaic of someone's every movement through some combination of GPS tracking or facial recognition, and you can produce a full picture of somebody's life that the government now can watch? Does that require some uh, alteration of what we usually understand to be searches and seizures, and does the constitutional law need to account for that? So I think what we can see as a theme of all of these kinds of arguments is that uh, in general, you'll see changes in technology used as a reason to depart from what may have been the previously understood rights or practices under the Constitution, and we need to, to move away from these. And generally, those who support free speech, those who support the Second Amendment, uh, press to retain an originalist view because an originalist view will sync with their classical liberal principles. I'm not saying everybody takes a sort of outcome-oriented view of the way they interpret the Constitution, but often you don't have to choose because, after all, the framers of the Constitution and the way the Constitution was originally understood was, for the most part, a classical liberal document ratified and written by mostly classical liberal people. So why do I say that the, the patent system has, some, has thrown classical liberalism and, orili and originalism into some conflict in recent years? Well, I'm thinking about the oil states case, which a lot of you may know. And uh, Professor Epstein certainly knows because I've seen him write on it, and he's been disappointed by the outcome in the case. Uh, so, so Professor Epstein, uh, you know, takes what I take to be uh, a quite powerful view of the basically the transportability of classical liberal property rights into the concept of modern uh, intellectual property rights. And he's written a, a fantastic article, which I commend to all of you, called the. Uh, disintegration of intellectual property. Do I have that right? A play 
on the title of the disintegration of property. So it was published, happened to be published the year I was on the articles committee at the Stanford Law Review, so I got to have some great familiarity with that article of his. Um, the basic argument is that actually promoting technology and having a sensible patent intellectual property system uh, will, will happen best if we adhere to classical liberal notions of property rights and try to uh, transport those over into the system of intellectual property. That typically works quite well. Uh, the simple rules for a complex world to coin a phrase. Uh, so in the oil states case, the court addressed the question of basically whether uh, an administrative proceeding can be used to invalidate a patent without the involvement of an Article III court. Now, if uh, patent rights were like traditional common law private property rights, you would need an Article III court to be involved before those rights could be destroyed and stripped from the right holder. So the Supreme Court confronted whether uh, that was the case with intellectual property rights, with patents. The Supreme Court decided in a 7-2 decision written by none other than Justice Thomas that these are not private rights, that these are not like classical liberal property rights, much to the consternation of Professor Epstein. It's an interesting case because you have the opinion being authored by one of the court's foremost originalists and I think someone who is also considered a foremost classical liberal on the court. And in dissent, you have Justice Gorsuch, who I think is probably the second or first in both of those categories on the court as well. Justice Gorsuch is joined by the chief, who I think is driven by his jealous guardianship of the Article III role of the federal judiciary. In any event, uh, I find Justice Thomas's opinion in this case distressingly persuasive on the question of original meaning, as much as I dislike the policy outcome that it drives. So my main goal here is for my own psychological well-being to convince Richard to convince me that I'm mistaken, and in fact there is no disparity between originalism and classical liberalism, and that Justice Thomas has it wrong as an original matter, as persuasive as I otherwise find the opinion to be. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Anthony. So we'll, we'll open the floor to questions in a minute, but I would love the opportunity to hear uh, the panelists, especially our early panelists, to respond to others. Um, with that, I will have to begin with Professor Epstein. Alas, um, I, I will tell you, let me just make a couple of discordant observations about various points. Uh, the first thing I think it's important to mention is something about the nature of the British system of patent law. One of the things is it's got the same formal exclusive right, but the procedures associated with the British system made it virtually impossible for anybody to contain some kind of a patent right by normal processes. And there was a conscious democratization uh, when one came to the United States about who could file, how much was needed, and so forth, none of which is directed by the patent clause, uh, but nonetheless was in practice. And it's really made a difference, because Arnold, Arnold Plant, a famous friend of Ronald Coase, wrote these very skeptical articles on the effects of the patent system in Great Britain, uh, and people have taken it to be a statement about patent systems generally, but in fact it was a reflection of the terrible situation of the British law, not one of the American law, and I think this thing went wrong. Okay. The second point I want to make is the question about how it is that we start to deal with social change and legal conceptions. Um, Forty years ago I wrote a paper called The Static Conception of the Common Law, which I think was designed to adumbrate something which has been said uh, by both Anthony and by way of John. And I said, you know, by and large, I'm a Roman lawyer by training. Somebody said, you've got to get that in here. And that most of this stuff, in fact, has incredible durability over time. Uh, but you do, in the area of property rights, have circumstances where you're going to have to have changes in laws in order to deal with technological improvements. Uh, but you have to understand the way in which they're done. Uh, to some people, they say, well, we don't like the current situation. Let's just de redesignate things as property rights one way or another. But as I constantly stress when I teach property, and I see one or two of my students here, uh, if you want to do this, there's a procedure for justification, which is essentially you try to show in all but the most extreme cases that the change that you want to make is a Pareto improvement over the previous state of affairs uh, so that you cannot confuse two functions, uh, one massive redistribution through the redefinition of property rights with general overall improvements that work for the benefit of all. And so the two cases that are most conspicuous is with respect to telecommunications. Nobody seriously believes that you ought to be able to enjoin a sue for damages. Somebody who says something from the electromagnetic spectrum across your land, even though it might be a technical trespass, because the gains across the system are so large. 
And with respect to overflights, at least when you're not dealing with landing rights, you make exactly the same judgment. So what you do is you condemn the overrights and you give people the benefits that they get of that particular system. These are such massive Pareto improvements that the corollary of this is that what you never ever do under these circumstances is try to figure out whether I got more out of this than you did. When you're trying to do that with 300 million people, forget about it, baby, you don't want. Now, when you get to the progressives, what they do is they completely and deliberately mess all of this up. And, and so just to take the telecommunications thing for one second, uh, what happens is uh, you really do need to prevent the chaos on the internet, and so you have to have defined rights. And what that means is that you have to have inter interference rules. But if you're uh, Justice Frankfurter and have the misguidance of a Harvard progressive liberal education, uh, what you do is you say, oh, we don't want to be so medicines to make sure that these frequencies are well defined so there's no interference. What we're going to do is to determine the composition of the traffic. And he had not the foggiest idea of how that should be done. And so by not having a strong system of property rights sold by auction or by occupation, depending on the circumstances, he created chaos that has lasted for a very, very long time inside of that particular organization. And so when I talked to John, I said, there's flexibility in some sense in the patent rights system, in the property rights system, to make these improvements, but there's not massive stuff to get redistribution. And a classical liberal will accept Pareto improvements, will be very suspicious about disguised redistribution. And the last point that I want to make about this is about the oil states case. I mean, it is one of the worst opinions that I've ever read. Um, and I'm sorry that Justice Thomas happened to write it, but um, the question is, if you're starting to go back to the historical roots, as Justice Gorsuch pointed out and Justice Robertson pointed out earlier, uh, what happens is the system of grants that were created under the patent clause was to create property rights in particular individuals. The public rights stuff came up only in connection with collections under customs duties in a case called um, Murray against Hunter's Lessee, what, no, whatever it is, Hoboken, city of Hoboken against Murray. It's a completely different kind of problem. And uh, all of the key opinions that talked about this were that way. And what happened is when uh, you start to say that the definition of public rights means anything which is a grant from the government, what you literally have to do is to overrule Precedent after precedent after precedent from the 19th century, the most conspicuous of which is a case named McConnell, not after the current senator or the eminent law professor, on these things. And Justice Thomas's argument, which had to be wrong, he said, gee, if they understood what the patent system was about, they would change their views with respect to what intellectual property is, um, which is the worst kind of sort of intellectual relativism. Uh, uh, this is a pretty straightforward thing, and the correct line in all of these cases is this guy gets to decide as a judge under those circumstances where there's been a final issue of the patent, and somebody else gets to decide as an administrator before that time. And if you don't draw the bright line, as our friend John Duffy will say, you're never going to get it right. And so there were a few little encroachments that were made in the 80s, and they paved the way uh, for somebody like Justice Breyer balancing himself to intellectual oblivion on this kind of issue, uh, to put himself into the case where he said, well, we've done it a little bit. We could do it a little bit more. Where am I to draw the balance? Uh, and the answer is on those kinds of questions, on property right formation questions, you want hard lines. You need the flexibility on some of the remedial questions. You don't need it there. So I hope I can persuade you, Anthony, uh, that you cannot find a worse decision on either separation of powers or on property rights than the oil rates decision. Fortunately, uh, much of the stuff that has been done badly in the Supreme Court has been undone by administrators inside the patent office, and so maybe we'll get some return to sanity. Well, I, I'm pleased that I uh, benefit from uh, the the we all we all can jumble and the the foreshadowing um, to respond to the data aggregation and new tech point as I foreshadowed by referencing Charles Darwin when I was in fact intending to reference Charles Dickens. Um, <laughs> but as I um, think about um, Dickens. <laughs> um, poor man's tale of a patent, it does connect up with Darwin and Darwinian um, evolution in the face of data aggregation and big data, which is to say, if you, if you listen to uh, Dan Geer's uh, 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 keynote at the Black Hat conference a few years ago, he, he makes, as others have made as well, the, the monoculture culture monopoly point. Um, so for the biologists in the room, if we all have the exact same DNA, it just takes, you know, one antibiotic or one toxin and, you know, we're all wiped out. 
Um, if our data is all in one place in the same way, there are a lot of vulnerabilities that come from that, including civil libertarian vulnerabilities that I believe you were focused on. And I, I don't think this is inconsistent with what you were saying. I, I think that we, there, are, there is room within the constitutional order to address that concern. And, and here again, the framers' approach to the patent antitrust system offers one significant leverage point, which is to say, there are at least a lot of us, including many of us up here, who have written about an approach to the patent antitrust system that would lead to, that would facilitate, maybe not require, but facilitate, in a meaningful way, the existence of a large plurality of firm sizes in the high-tech sector, rather than what we generally have now, which is a relatively small number of very, very large firms. And that is the monoculture problem, and that is a concrete solution to the monoculture problem, whether it's for civil libertarian purposes or national security purposes. So I, I, I think the data aggregation problem is, is significant, and I did want to say that the, um, that is, I think, sort of a forward-looking thing. Most of my talk is about why technology change doesn't matter, but this, this piece, I think, is why it might very well matter. And there really are some incredibly powerful examples. So for example, this is one example that just really made an impression on me, is that there was an MIT PhD graduate student who was indicted for insider trading because his wife was a lawyer in New York and obviously had some inside information on deals. And part of the indictment recited um, a, a fact that I found very interesting, that this guy's Google search had be, how does SEC catch insider traders? Um, which they had in the indictment, and I thought, well, you know, that's really bad evidence for that guy. Um, they had lots of other evidence too, but that, they knew that. And the interesting thing is they may not have even needed a warrant to get that. They may have asked Google and Google said, yeah, we got that data and, you know, we'll give it to you. It's our data, you know, but we'll provide it. It's, you know, we've got it here and they may not need, they, if, if Google said, no, we're not going to give it to you, then they might need some sort of compulsory process. But they may not have needed any compulsory process. And I think that that gives, you know, an example in which, you know, a lot of things we do. Uh, are, are subject to these, uh, to uh, increased data aggregation and, um, and also long-tailed memory. So the Europeans are developing a sort of theory of the right to be forgotten. And I hate to say it, but they might be onto something there, that there's, that there's something in there. I know Richard probably doesn't like this, but there is, there's, they may be going about it the wrong way because they're regulating private companies. But there is something about the increased aggregation of data, which I think is, should be somewhat scary to civil libertarians um, and, is, and, is, and is maybe genuinely new, that simply memory of humans, the, the paper records were so disorganized that, and it was so expensive to collect information that it wasn't a so big a problem in the founding era and therefore that, you know, we, we don't have any rules about this. Now, the first thing to do is to legislate, and obviously the Constitution gives both the federal and the state governments lots of room to legislate. There may even be some, some constitutional changes, and you know that can be done maybe through judicial interpretation in, in some cases, um, but maybe also through the Article Five process, which I think people forget about all the time, but I think we should include. We can be, we can be the originalists. We can, we can dictate a, uh, a constitutional amendment if we, if we find one that's wise. So, well, Anthony uh, is uh, making some final comments. I'll invite people to come to the microphone if they have questions as well so that we can begin the queue for audience questions. Yeah, just let me respond briefly, I think, with the same thematic point that I think goes both to John and Richard, which is that, um, you know, it, it's not exactly groundbreaking to say that the policy outcomes we prefer and the constitutional interpretations we think uh, are most faithful to the process of interpretation may lead us to different results and that constitutional interpretation is not going to always lead to the best policy solutions and is not going to address every problem that we see arising. So it may well be that we need uh, legislation rather than interpretation or constitutional amendment to address problems like non-Article three judges invalidating patents or like uh, data aggregation. But I think um, 
legislatures are in many ways a better tool for, for doing this because they're you know much better able to operate with a scalpel than with a sledgehammer of, of a court decision taking off the table uh, what you might be able to do with respect to Article Three courts or administrative proceedings or how you would have a judicial system trying to regulate the use of GPS tracking or the use of data aggregation. Judicial decisions are necessarily limited and reactive and so you know, when I worked for, for Justice Alito, I know he took the very strong view that courts should leave room on something like GPS tracking for a sensitive legislative solution. Uh, I know that's not perfect, but it may be the best we can do. Question. Somebody's going to a microphone. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hi, Rob Rando, New York. Um, I'm also a member of the Federalist Society Intellectual Property practice group, and I want to thank the panel. It's been outstanding. Um, the question I have, and, and PTO Director Yanku has raised this issue, um, in terms of author and inventor with respect to artificial intelligence within the context of this program, and this is for anyone on the panel. Well, the answer is who controls the program would be the person. Joint authorship is permissible. Assignment of joint authorship to companies after the patent has been perfected is permissible. And so if you have good rules on joint ownership, it seems to me that they should be able to handle that. Or the way in which you then would do this is with any other syndication where you're trying to get uh, a group of people to invest in an idea. Uh, what you do is you have to have a governance structure with respect to that, and you have to have a distribution with respect to the benefits so that each penny is accounted for in some kind of a consistent way. Uh, so the way in which you handle that is not to muck around with the patent system, um, but to essentially muck around in a sensible contractual way um, with the facilitation of multiple authorship. And there's nothing, I think, about the word author in the Constitution which says that every patent has to have only a single inventor. And so I don't think that that presents anything other than a very serious business and management problem, but I don't think it presents a problem having to do with the scope and the power of the patent clause. Yeah, I mean, I think I would just add that artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, techniques and data science generally um, can be very useful within government, not only within industry, as um, facilitators of more efficient as well as more effective operating. So if you want the patent office examiner in the old days to go to the shoe to look through the wrapper, um, you know, those are not only uh, high paper cut risk but take a fair amount of time, um, uh, you can immediately see that one of the very, very, very large parts of the United States government, the U.S. Patent Office, is mostly that big because it hires a lot of very expensive people to do a lot of searching and searching something AI, ML, and data science do well. Sure, sure. I think that um, most of the time, at, at least with our current technology, we're miles from having you know, an Android that is like data on Star Trek that actually can do something creative. Instead, these are just like tools, and people who direct the tool towards a particular problem, those people are the inventor. Um, and I, I wouldn't even make, say that you necessarily have to make it a joint inventorship. You, you don't say it's the, it's the machine plus the human. It's the human. It's the human who details the problem. I mean, even the best computer today does not sort of say, oh, by the way, while I was figuring out all the chess moves that you, you had me do, I also figured out a cure for cancer. Do you want that? No, that, that does not happen. Instead, people have to direct the machine to a problem. They have to load it with data. They have to give it lots of patterns to recognize. And, and then maybe it comes up with something we could not see, but, but people direct it towards that problem. So I don't think that, that it is, a, is such a big problem. It can change something called the non-obviousness doctrine, which generally says that things that are easy to invent um, are not patentable. And the more tools we get, and this is not just AI, it's computers, but it's every tools. Any tool that makes things really, really easy to invent could make some things not patentable because people can do them in a trivial fashion. So I think it could affect that. But again, that's, that's just simply extending existing principles, existing general principles, to, um, to a, a, new, a slightly new situation. So I appreciate that. I, I, I would just think, you know, uh, to your point, in terms of inventorship, um, thinking, you know, bring it back to the human. In, in the case of artificial intelligence, 
you might have to track through very various levels to find out how many humans were involved. Well, that's okay. That's true. Well, that's yeah. then. Then I agree with Richard that you know that's a team of inventors, and most patents these days are are are, are the inventors is a, a, a team of people rather than a single person. I think that's right. I think you would only start to see a real fundamental challenge at the point which we may never reach, but we might where you get independent artificial intelligence that can invent and innovate without the need for incentives because after all the foundational principle of granting patents and exclusive rights is we need to do that to incentivize people to make innovations and discoveries and inventions and if you know the independent computer um, is walking around out there making inventions without any need for incentive uh, to, to do that then maybe we have to reevaluate it. I don't think we're going to see that in our lifetimes but maybe I'll be pleasantly surprised. Thank you. Thanks. Another question over here, and if you can, just mention your name and perhaps yes. where you're from at the beginning. My name is Howard Klein. I'm on the uh, IP uh, uh, Practice Group Executive Committee. Um, uh, thank you. This is a great panel. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really great. Thanks, Mark, for putting this together. Um, in the past six or seven years, we've watched the, uh, the Supreme Court interpret patent el el eligibility rules in a way that's pretty much excluded some of our most cutting-edge technologies. Uh, diag medical diagnostics, computer science, uh, these are things where the U.S. is the leader of the world technologically. We've seen uh, now China becoming uh, basic, almost supplanting us or positioned to supplant us in the patent world in these areas. How do you see these judicial exceptions to the just judicially created exceptions to patent eligibility, how do you see that as being consistent with either the original meaning of the constitutional empowerment uh, under Article Article One, uh, and most importantly, the text, the very the, the simple text of Section One Hundred One of the Patent Statute? I think um, you're talking about Allison Mayo. Um, these yes, are self-inflicted disasters of the worst order by a Supreme Court, which simply does not understand what's going on. Um, uh, Scott uh, is permanently scarred with having clerk for Giles Rich um, as his last clerk, who got it right as early as 1994. If you're starting to put together elements which are innocent when taken to themselves, but have a combination so that if you start at the beginning, you could do a functionality that you could not have done previously, that ought to be enough to guarantee sort of patentability. And so what happens is under the Alice Mayo test, essentially all forms of modern technology are treated as belonging into the public domain. If you then go back to the theory which says either we give protection to labor in some form or another, or what will happen is we won't get it, it will be dissipated, that's exactly what's going to happen in these cases. It's important to understand, however, what the labor theory of value actually means. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to spend so much labor that essentially you dissipate all the net gain you could get from the patent. It says that you, the guy who puts the inventors in, we want you to spend as little as possible to make something um, which is invented because it increases the social surplus, both in the terms of what the inventor gets and in terms of the lower prices that he could give to everybody else. And that's a classic illustration of a Supreme Court as a non-specialist body. Um, who has this kind of deep suspicion of patents as being somehow or other robbing something from the public domain, which has led to a major disaster and it will ship technology overseas and will make it harder to implement here. Um, you know, there's been a large battle between the Federal Circuit and the patent, uh, the Supreme Court on some of these issues, and you could take one side or another on other things, but I think those two decisions together and there are more that are promised the other way. There's, I think, a petition for certiorari from coming up from, the, from your court where everybody agreed that the decisions were nuts, and then <laughs> the issue is whether you could distinguish a particular case or whether or not it was bound. If a court which contains young and able judges has to do that kind of deliberation, then the Supreme Court really has to engage in massive retrospective thinking about whether or not it has created more danger than it has eliminated. I regard these decisions as an unmitigated disaster. Yeah, and I, I, I really think the short answer to your question implicit in what Richard's saying is not. They're not compatible. The, the, what the court's doing in those cases is not compatible with the plain meaning, not compatible with the different meanings. Uh, the drafters of those statutes clearly had in mind when they chose different words. So they didn't say Section 101, give patents on good inventions, Section 102, really good inventions, Section 103, the really good ones who are also really your friends, or any other vague language like that. They in fact said really straightforward things like, if it's not new, it's not patentable. If it's not new and also not 
and also obvious than not patentable. They pick very specific words, novelty, non-obviousness. They have a whole um, set of words for how precise the patentee has to be in meeting the disclosure or written description or enablement requirements. And what the courts do when they ignore all of those words is they end up importing all of those words into some version of the patentable subject matter debate and then finding, oh my gosh, I've taken these words that have lots of interpretive baggage and I'm now going to just reinterpret them willy-nilly. And that inevitably leads to, I think, a lot of consternation for the courts and a lot of consternation for the parties who appear before the courts. And yeah, I think it's, in effect, a mess. It's unfortunate. I, I agree with that as a statutory matter. It seems to me there's no constitutional argument, though. I think the courts have gotten wrong the meaning of the statute, but I, I, I think under the, the you know, Article 1 that Congress has quite broad leeway to tailor eligibility rules. It could have written the eligibility rules the way the court says it did. I think the court got that wrong, but to me, I don't see how that runs afoul of the original meaning of the Constitution. I think the legislature can fix this problem. It's happened before. I hope it will happen again. I think it's hard to see unless judges uh, in the lower courts can create a fairly ingenious system of restoring some of those rules in light of the Supreme Court's precedent. I think we need a legislative fix, but I don't think we've got any constitutional arguments to get us there. Uh, I'll just say that when you start saying, um, what do you think about these atextual judicial exceptions? Um, you know, I get off that bus pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> if, you're, if you're a textualist, um, then, you know, the court says, these are these judicially created exceptions that don't really uh, uh, have a home in the text of the statute, which the court explicitly <laughs> said in Bilski, uh, one of the decisions. Well, you know, that's, that should be the time that uh, you get off the bus. Now, why the conservative majority, uh, you know, signs on to these opinions. I, I, I must say, I think one, one day soon, hopefully, they're going to wake up and say, what has Justice Breyer convinced us to do? You know, why are we expanding beyond any historical uh, thing? We know we did have these precedents about exceptions, um, but we're expanding them dramatically, and you can prove that empirically very easily. So why, why have we conv been convinced to do that because we're supposed to stick to the text. We're textualists, aren't we? Yeah. So I think, I hope that will happen someday soon. Um, and I think there's been a lot of both bad judging and bad lawyering in those cases in, in multiple ways. Um, and I think that hopefully we can get uh, uh, more sophisticated people who come up and, 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 and are able to guide the justices well. You have to have good lawyers to present these cases in a way that the, the, especially the conservative justices can understand. I just, just an observation, I, the Federal Circuit just recently ruled that a garage door opener is an abstraction and therefore not patent eligible subject matter. But there's nothing new under the sun because the 19th century Supreme Court held that a pencil eraser was unpatentable as an abstract idea too. Um, so that's true. And so, you know, there are these persistent errors. If you know history, it, there are, some of these errors go back a long way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Back, uh, back to originalism. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, Roger Klein, not related, but friends. Uh, <laughs> if you'll indulge me a comment. So I was an expert in the Myriad case for Association for Molecular Pathology. A, in addition to being an attorney, I'm a molecular pathologist. I ex couldn't disagree more with what you said. So with respect to Mayo, were it not for Mayo, we could not do gene sequencing, sequencing genomes, that, which we do regularly. I, I, I have to say, I mean, when, so when, how did when the these- So how did the human genome get sequenced while those patents were in It was research. We do it clinically. For example, Myriad Genetics, when people were doing BRCA1 and 2 testing, nobody could test for BRCA1 yeah. and 2. They were behind technologically five years. What, between Myriad, between the Myriad case and Mayo, what happened was you could no longer patent a variant in the genome and the relationship with the genotype-phenotype association. Because of that, we were able to, we, we routinely, routinely sequence exomes. The prices come qu down. Question, it costs billions of dollars uh, to, to do the original. Yeah. You can get an exome done for 500 bucks. And after the Myriad case, the price dropped immediately.
And mean, these were not real inventions. Okay. And, do, 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 okay. Okay. But these are not right inventions. <laughs> what, what, these what? are not inventions. What the, they're, they're not discoveries. What they are the is IP their properties. Can I give a one sentence answer to this? I, I, I mean, you, no, you can't. Do, do you have a question, though, Mr. Collins? No, no I, it was a comment. Okay. And I've been, our, at the Thank Association you. of Electrical Pathology, look at, look at our vendors. Diagnostic. Stop being clothing. hysterical for a second, <laughs> okay. all right? Let me answer. Okay. Grow up is what I wanted to say. Look, the, the point about the broxine is a different problem. I agree with you that the patent should not extend to testing something which is in situ in the body. But I don't agree that if somebody makes a new and artificial entity that if you want to sell that outside of it, you can do it. So I think, in effect, the myriad patent was too broad. But if you give it in sensible lines, Alice and Mayo, it turns out, are also incorrect. What you've done is you've conflated the two issues. You have to be more careful. And you're not. I'm talking we'll about Mayo. Uh, so I do uh, think, actually, that I agree with Richard here that you know the, the, some of the patents that were invalidated in, in the four decisions uh, uh, on 101 could have been, and I think actually maybe all of them could have been invalidated on traditional grounds that are actually in the text of the statute. And I'd be totally happy with that decision. I might quibble about here and there, but a lot of those patents were questionable for traditional God. reasons. It's just bad to taste, sort of create this new doctrine that's judicially created, expand it, and pretty soon you get decisions that you dis probably would disagree with, the garage door uh, openers and other things. I think we'll but have I, to transition to, to Judge data. Braden now. She's been so polite standing there with the questions. So, yeah. Judge Braden. I'm a retired and uh, federal judge that's also recuperating. But I, ha um, I think Professor Epstein will remember a time when the Supreme Court's antitrust jurisprudence was as um, Mixed up. disruptive as it that is in the intellectual property area. And the use of the gui of guidelines that began with the Justice Department, which basically were dictated, as I understand, to Steve Breyer in the golf course by his, <coughs> the AAG at the time. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about the uh, Patent Office guidelines that have come out, which, from my perspective, I think really do go a long way to solve the problem, but the Federal Circuit has decided that they don't give deference to those guidelines. Well, I mean, I haven't read the guidelines. I'm, I, I mean, my view about them, if they're sound, you ought to follow them, if not. On the antitrust stuff, essentially what they did is the conventional measure of concentration would be a Herfindahl index, and you had to have a fairly high movement, say 0.25, before you really got excited, with sort of 4-3 merges being the case. And what they were doing is going after Utah Pie and Brown Shoe, and it was way off. Bork wrote his book, Bowman wrote his articles at the time, and they became accepted wisdom. I am proud to say that I, one of the reasons I lost a faint chance at a Supreme Court clerkship is I went after a man named Murray Bring, extremely smart guy, a clerk for Warren, and I told him I thought that Brown Shoe, this is back in 1967, was one of the great stains on the history of antitrust law. So I think we've moved the antitrust stuff down. We need to have somebody write a synthetic book on patents, uh, which will set the ship aright, understanding, by the way, that a central part of the patent system is there are certain things which are in the common domain, and you don't want the notion of an invention to be so broad uh, that essentially it allows allows you to patent what's in your genome so it can't be tested by anybody else. Question on the side of the room? Yep. Uh, Nick Rotz, I'm a current law clerk. And so if, the, as the panelists may have suggested, that the Supreme Court is using 101 to short circuit 103, would a reverse doctrine of equivalence be a preferable approach to prevent um, infringement for <coughs> inventions that aren't meritorious? Yeah. I know. <laughs> uh, the explanation is the fundamental problem of eligibility on Section 101 is so broad that to try to use any version of the equivalence doctrine, direct or reverse, to fix the fundamental mistake is not there. Uh, the equivalence doctrine is, this is the kind of, quote, flexibility issue that, uh, that John Duffy referred to. Uh, if you have a literal patent and somebody comes so close to it uh, that essentially they create, for example, in the easiest case, a new patent by simply substituting one molecule for another, essentially pinching on the label of another, uh, if you haven't specified that, you're willing to say that it's covered by some kind of a very narrow penumbra. But it's a very narrow doctrine. 
and it's not designed to make sure that uh, what you can do is patent something which serves the same functionality, for example, as somebody that's already under a patent. And I just don't think that a doctrine that exotic can actually um, get it right. I think you have to, as John Duffy said, Scott said, I think everyone agrees with it, you have to be much more serious about the breadth of scope under the patent eligibility doctrine and hidden exceptions. I'm not against exceptions, by the way, but these are absolutely con contradictory to the stuff that's in the text. These are not police power exceptions, latches exceptions, and so forth. That's what you have to fight, and I think you have to fight it straight up. I think that a lot of the patents that the Supreme Court has recently held invalid on 101 were, are invalid under traditional doctrines, not just 103 obviousness, but also under other scope doctrines. Uh, so for example, the Mayo case, which might be is one of the most troubling one is it really sort of hurt medical testing. That patent in particular, if you look at traditional mid 20th century sources on claiming, clearly unambiguously had a claiming defect that was set forth in treatises on claiming that said the one thing you cannot do is write a claim like this and it's exactly the way the Mayo claim is written. Um, and and the reason was because it's indefinite. Indefiniteness? Uh, Pardon me? Yes, this is, I've got it written on this, and, and, really? and this is, yeah, this is, it's quite clear, the whereas clause, you can't put your novelty in a whereas clause. That was a rule, there's theory behind it. So I, I do think that, the, the, that there are a number of doctrines. Narrowing patents for, with a doctrine of, uh, with a reverse doctrine of equivalence is one way to, to, to deal with these problems. And I think that the infringement doctrines are largely left up to judicial development. The, the Patent Act itself doesn't have any of the language about how to actually determine infringement. So there I think judges can say, well, the Patent Act just says we're engaged in infringement analysis. We've long been doing that with case law since the 19th century. Congress keeps reenacting the same language. So, you know, that's sort of a, a basic ratification of our judicially developed doctrines on what does it mean to infringe a patent. So I, I think that's another tool that they could do and they would have a theory traceable back to the statutory language and to ratification as to why they're doing what they're doing. The, the judicial exceptions, I think, sadly, they don't have that theory. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Horowitz, I'm a student at Stanford. Uh, it's my understanding that the Trademark Acts and Lanham Act are passed under the Commerce Clause and not the IP Clause. Uh, with many originalists proposing a scaling back of the Commerce Clause to uh, pre-New Deal uh, jurisprudence, uh, what major doctrinal shifts do you think in IP law will result from that, if that happens? Well, I, I, will, I will just mention, as long as we're talking um, about kind of big data and other things, and you raise the question of both the kind of trademark notion of the Lanham Act and the false advertising notion, two kind of slightly separate notions. Um, it is worth just separating them on the one hand from what we all often experience as big data on the other hand. So let me give you some concrete examples. When you log on to the internet um, and and have in mind what you're looking for and get barraged with ads, that's a form of speech that may very well be worth protecting constitutionally, probably should be because the Constitution says so, but from a commercial perspective is probably, from your perspective, searching far more of a cost than it is a benefit. On the other hand, if there is a mark, whether it's a name or an image, that you can quickly recognize, then in fact that's serving to decrease your search cost, and so is commercial truth. So the theory that could support a robust trademark and false advertising regime, that notion of decreased search cost and improved market efficiency, would be a theory that would be coherent, sensible, helpful, and would fit within Commerce Clause power if Congress chooses to promulgate that statute. But I don't know that it falls for lack of power or is required as a so-called right, and I think that's why it makes sense to locate it in the Commerce Clause power. And I'll just say it's not just the trademark. Congress just passed a trade secret law that used to be state law, you know, within recent memory. And now it's, you know, there's a large federal statute that is, you know, sort of the burgeoning area of practice 
is trade secret law, also not based on the intellectual property clause, also clearly based on the commerce clause power. I think the commerce clause is actually a good example where maybe technology change doesn't change the Constitution, but just puts more stuff in it. I mean, it is true that there's greater commerce among the states and among uh, um, co other countries too. I think sometimes that argument is oversold and that the court has you know, expanded commerce clause jurisprudence quite clearly, but even if you narrow it to some degree, still a lot of things are, are, are you know, shoes and clothes and everything else are just marketed in all 50 states and that's where the Lanham Act applies, that's where the trade secret uh, law applies. And I don't think it's going to make a huge difference if the, if the Commerce Clause were narrowed somewhat. And just for the fun of it, if you're really curious about this stuff and like kind of civil libertarian case law and, and constitutional case law, go, go read the, the, the Supreme Court Bose Consumer Credit Union decision argued by a great Boston lawyer with a bow tie, Chuck Hyken. Um, uh, who had been a college classmate of Amar Bose, um, but, but Chuck um, did what a lot of First Amendment lawyers thought was gonna be impossible, and he did it as a trademark patent lawyer, and, and what he did was sued a publication uh, for, in effect, a false statement about Bose's speakers, and the defense um, tried to be, uh, hey, it's our First Amendment right, we can say whatever we want, and his response was, in effect, you can if it's clear, it's opinion, you can't if what you are saying is it's fact, and it turns out you actually have no facts to back up what you're saying is fact. So they lost, they, the publisher, because they said it was fact and they didn't have fact. Thank you. Oh my God. Other questions? Uh, yeah, I I'm have a comment, okay. <laughs> if there's no Professor other question, Epstein. God forbid. I mean, I just went back and looked at Mayo again, um, just to remind <laughs> myself. Um, it's amazing what you could do when you have a computer. But uh, there's a very important line here, uh, which you can get both right and wrong, which is the question, what is or does not count as a natural law? And essentially, I think E equals MC squared counts as a natural law. Uh, but running a test which says that you reach a certain level of threshold sensibility with respect to the administration of one drug for one kind of condition is not to be regarded as a natural law because it means you can't make a diagnostic kit for anything uh, that comes out from under. Yes, 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 no, no, no. Um, so I, I think it's important that one understands that. Uh, there was a period before the 52 Act was passed um, there was a case called Funk in which the question is if you found a bunch of things that you could put together in the same sack that were compatible and you did it through an immense amount of churching, they said, well, that was just a natural law. I don't think, in effect, that finding particular correlations through a system of trial and error, which turn out to be true and verified in that fashion, uh, should basically be covered by the natural law exception or by the mathematical exception. And it, what's happened is that the 52 Act was passed in large part in reaction to the rather narrow interpretation that the Supreme Court, chiefly through Justice Douglas, had given in patent stuff in the 40s in order to do it. And when I see cases like Alice and Mayo, I think what you're doing is you're really going back um, to the pre-1952 situation and that that, in fact, is some kind of a mistake. The Brock gene, as I've said before, is highly distinguishable. Uh, but I think when you start to figure out the amount of effort that it takes to get these tests there, to say that somebody else can simply imitate it without any particular payment at all, when they could buy kits in a competitive market and other people can then do other tests, I think it's a big mistake. Yep. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Art Mackenberg. Uh, wondering if you can speak to the the uh, originalist approach to the temporal aspects of this clause. It says to promote the progress of science and useful arts, and then it says limited times. And so, you know, a layperson uh, just looks at it and says, well, there's an infant industry argument. We'll protect these people for a certain amount of time, and then after that, it's a, it's a uh, you know, the market will approach it and spread the word, and, and new things will occur then again uh, and multiply. But it seems like in a high-tech world, the limited times would be very short, or at least shorter than they were during the founding era. I think they were around 14 years or something like that. Now it seems like they're getting longer, and I 
I don't understand why. Well, well, you definitely have administrability problems if you start drawing lines between or among different areas of technology, especially, as we all know, as technology goes faster. In the modern world, is a hospital a hospital or is it a large data center backed up by a lot of equipment with also some people? Um, how about finance? Uh, how about and how about and how about? So when you start to try to draw lines, what you find, I think, is very quickly shifts in claim drafting and kind of, um, uh, so in, in, the, in the period in the 1970s where there was a fair amount of uncertainty about whether software to, could be programmed, the two central techniques people had for coping with it was to claim a, generally, a general purpose computer having been programmed a certain way, claim the box, or a disk encoded with a certain program, claim the, the disk, rather than claim the program. So, and then now you can fight over, you know, whether uh, that uh, counts as a disk or counts as a box rather than counting as code. Um, I, I think you're gonna find that's where you end up going with uh, um, should you meter the right amount of time debate. I, I guess the, my other core concern about metering the right amount of time is what's your concern? If technology really moves that quickly, then aren't all those patents pretty irrelevant? Yeah, I mean, and if, they're, if you're really saying the opposite, they're really valuable, then is it you want the no patents on the non-valuable stuff, or you want the no patents on the valuable stuff? Because I think what we often find in these debates is um, it's not a mama bear, papa bear, get it just right debate. It's a, I don't want to be an infringer debate, so I'd love it if you could just get rid of those patents being yeah. asserted against me. I would draw a strong distinction between the copyright side and the patent side. On the copyright side, I get a song, and you know, this could last for a very long period of time. Um, you know, Mickey Mouse is finally starting to decay in value because people have different sensibilities, but you know, it's an 80 or 90 year run. And, and I think, in effect, you ought to give a patent which somehow reflects that, but not to life plus 70 years. And so I think, in effect, limited terms is 2014, 28, looking at the original 1790 period and maybe doubling it and so forth. With respect to the patent saves, I don't think it's a serious problem. Uh, because what happens is, um, I did some work on this about 10 years ago, and you realize that the effective monopoly of a patent in terms of rival competition has systematically gone down all throughout the 20th century. Uh, so if you would have invented a certain kind of a vacuum cleaner in 1920, you might have a really dominant position to the end of the patent. But now the new cycles come up much more rapidly. And so if somebody else has a new patent which renders the old patent essentially unimportant in terms of commercial stuff, you don't have to shorten the period with respect to it because the natural forces will displace it. And my understanding, at least when I worked with some of these companies, is they say, if I can't get an invention patented very quickly, this thing is gonna lose half of its value within 30 months. And so the real question is not the duration of the patent, it's a question of just how quickly you could get it off the ground uh, so as to put it into circulation before it stops. So when they had the Microsoft stuff where you, before you could do anything, you had to run it through a committee of review, essentially they didn't bother to do anything because the period of review took away all the useful commercial time of this stuff. So I think they're two very, very different problems. I'll say that, well, this is a fascinating area that I'm working on a paper on um, about the patent and the copyright system have absolutely diverged in, in this way because the, the copyright term, Richard is right, has gotten longer and longer. But before you go condemning that, realize it's gotten longer and longer in every country. Um, so it's not just us. It's like, there, you know, an economist might look at this and just say, this is data. You know, it's getting longer and longer in every country. In the, in, the, in the patent uh, area, it's, it's not only the, the de facto term has gotten shorter, the de jure term has gotten shorter because um, it used to be the copyright you had to renew your, pat, your, your copyright. They, they, we've eliminated that and most of the rest of the world has done that too. And instead, the, the rest of the world and our country have actually switched to renewing renewal fees for patents and it's very short period of time. So the average patent now lasts less than a decade. The, the, fewer than 50% of patents survive into their second decade. So it's actually shorter than the, the founding. And so it's kind of interesting that, it, that the, the systems have have changed, and my co-author and I look at this, among other things, and think it's an example of property rights being optimized over time, and we have, we have a theory about that. I mean, Richard might think that, that the copyright is gone 
gone off the rails, but it's hard to say every country, everywhere no, in the world not. has gone off the rails. Monopoly public choice things are endemic to the world. Yeah, but yeah. you know. I mean, and well, in but fact, but we the patent system is going the opposite way. Well, we it's understand sort of that thing. because there's a real difference. The expected useful life of an artistic work by given the fact that you have multiple ways in which you can express it has gotten longer and more powerful. And for the patents, it turns out the substitution rates are much higher. Uh, but I Not regard- Not for fundamental it, patents. The Wright brothers' patent would still be getting royalties to Today, because it still is exactly how every jet plane. Uh, no, I'm, look, I, I'm, I'm not. I say, I'm on, saying, that, on that disagreement, I think we are out of time. <laughs> We're out of time. Well, thank you so much to our panelists. <laughs>